Question 1. Brian Stevenson is an equity analyst and is developing a research report on Iberia Corporation at the request of his supervisor. Iberia is a conglomerate entity with significant corporate holdings in various industries. Specifically, Stevenson is interested in the effects of Iberia's investments on its financial performance and has decided to focus on two investments, Midland Incorporated and Odessa Company. Midland Incorporated On December 31, 2007, Iberia purchased 5 million common shares of Midland Incorporated for on negation 80 million. Midland has a total of 12.5 million common shares outstanding. The market value of Iberia's investment in Midland was on negation 89 million at the end of 2008 and on negation 85 million at the end of 2009. For the year ended 2008, Midland reported net income of on negation 30 million and paid dividends of on negation 10 million. For the year ended 2009, Midland reported a loss of on negation 5 million and paid dividends of on negation 4 million. During 2010, Midland sold goods to Iberia and reported 20% gross profit from the sale. Iberia sold all of the goods to a third party in 2010. Question 1. Odessa Company. On January 2, 2009, Iberia purchased 1 million common shares of Odessa Company as a long-term investment. The purchase price was on negation 20 per share and on. December 31, 2009, the market price of Odessa was on negation 17 per share. The decline in value was considered temporary. For the year ended 2009, Odessa reported net income of on negation 750 million and paid a dividend of on negation 3 per share. Iberia considers its investment in Odessa as an investment in financial assets. In addition, Iberia has a number of foreign investments, so Stevenson's supervisor has asked him to draft a report on accounting methods and ratio analysis. The following are statements from Stevenson's research report. Statement 1, under U.S. GAAP, Firms are required to use proportionate consolidation to account for joint ventures. Statement 2. In general, if the parent's consolidated net income is positive, the equity method reports a higher net profit margin than the acquisition method. Is Stevenson's statement regarding proportionate consolidation correct? A. Yes. B. No, because under U.S. GAAP, proportionate consolidation is allowed only in very limited situations. C. No, because under U.S. GAAP, Proportionate consolidation is never allowed under any circumstances. The correct answer is B. Under U.S. GAAP, the equity method is required in accounting for a joint venture. Proportionate consolidation is not allowed except in very limited situations. Proportionate consolidation is the preferred method for joint venture accounting under International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. Therefore, he statement is not correct. Question 2. Brian Stevenson is an equity analyst and is developing a research report on Iberia Corporation at the request of his supervisor. Iberia is a conglomerate entity with significant corporate holdings in various industries. Specifically, Stevenson is interested in the effects of Iberia's investments on its financial performance and has decided to focus on two investments, Midland Incorporated and Odessa Company. Midland Incorporated. On December 31, 2007, Iberia purchased 5 million common shares of Midland Incorporated for on negation 80 million. Midland has a total of 12.5 million common shares outstanding. The market value of Iberia's investment in Midland was on negation 89 million at the end of 2008 and on negation 85 million at the end of 2009. For the year ended 2008, Midland reported net income of on negation 30 million and paid dividends of on negation 10 million. For the year ended 2009, Midland reported a loss of on negation 5 million and paid dividends of on negation 4 million. During 2010, Midland sold goods to Iberia and reported 20% gross profit from the sale. Iberia sold all of the goods to a third party in 2010. Question 2. Odessa Company. On January 2, 2009, Iberia purchased 1 million common shares of Odessa Company as a long-term investment. The purchase price was on negation 20 per share and on. December 31, 2009, the market price of Odessa was on negation 17 per share. The decline in value was considered temporary. For the year ended 2009, Odessa reported net income of on negation 750 million and paid a dividend of on negation 3 per share. Iberia considers its investment in Odessa as an investment in financial assets. In addition, Iberia has a number of foreign investments, so Stevenson's supervisor has asked him to draft a report on accounting methods and ratio analysis. The following are statements from Stevenson's research report. Statement 1, under U.S. GAAP, firms are required to use proportionate consolidation to account for joint ventures. Statement 2, in general, 
If the parent's consolidated net income is positive, the equity method reports a higher net profit margin than the acquisition method. Is Stevenson's statement regarding the effect on profit margin correct? A. Yes. B. No. Net profit margin will be lower using the equity method. C. No. Net profit margin will be the same using either the equity method or the acquisition method. The correct answer is A. In a profitable year, net profit margin, net income slash sales, will be higher under the equity method because sales are lower under the equity method. Acquisition includes the sales figures for both the parent and subsidiary while the equity method only includes the sales figure for the parent company. Net income is the same under both methods. Therefore, the statement is correct. Question 3. Andrew Carson is an equity analyst employed at Lee, Vincent, and Associates, an investment research firm. In a conversation with his supervisor, Daniel Lau, Carson makes the following two statements about defined contribution plans. Statement I, employers often face onerous disclosure requirements. Statement 2, employers often bear all the investment risk. Carson is responsible for following Samolsky Enterprises, Samolsky, a publicly traded firm that produces motorcycles and other mechanical parts. It operates exclusively in the United States. At the end of its 2009 fiscal year, Samolsky's employee pension plan had a projected benefit obligation, PBO, of $320 million. Also, unrecognized prior service costs were $35 million, the fair value of plan assets was $316 million, and the unrecognized actuarial gain was $21 million. Carson believes the rate of compensation increase will be 5% as opposed to 4% in the previous year, and the discount rate will be 7% as opposed to 8% in the previous year. Question 3. This past year, Samolsky began using special purpose entities, SPEs, for various reasons. In preparation for analyzing the SPE disclosures and the footnotes to the financial statements, Carson prepares a memo on SPEs. In the memo, he correctly concludes that the company will be required under new accounting rules to classify them as variable interest entities, VIE, and consolidate the entities on the balance sheet rather than report them using the equity method as in the past. Is Carson correct with respect to defined contribution plans? A. Both statements are incorrect. B. Only statement 1 is incorrect. C. Only statement 2 is incorrect. The correct answer is A. Statement 1. Employers often face onerous disclosure requirements incorrect. The accounting is quite simple and the onerous disclosure requirements are more characteristic of defined benefit plans. Statement 2. Employers often bear all the investment risk incorrect. Benefits received by each individual employee on retirement depends on the investment performance of each individual's personal retirement fund. Thus, the employees bear the investment risk. Question 4. Andrew Carson is an equity analyst employed at Lee, Vincent, and Associates, an investment research firm. In a conversation with his supervisor, Daniel Lau, Carson makes the following two statements about defined contribution plans. Statement I, employers often face onerous disclosure requirements. Statement 2, employers often bear all the investment risk. Carson is responsible for following Samolsky Enterprises, Samolsky, a publicly traded firm that produces motorcycles and other mechanical parts. It operates exclusively in the United States. At the end of its 2009 fiscal year, Samolsky's employee pension plan had a projected benefit obligation, PBO, of $320 million. Also, unrecognized prior service costs were $35 million, the fair value of plan assets was $316 million, and the unrecognized actuarial gain was $21 million. Carson believes the rate of compensation increase will be 5% as opposed to 4% in the previous year, and the discount rate will be 7% as opposed to 8% in the previous year. Question 4. This past year, Samolsky began using special purpose entities, SPEs, for various reasons. In preparation for analyzing the SPE disclosures and the footnotes to the financial statements, Carson prepares a memo on SPEs. In the memo, he correctly concludes that the company will be required under new accounting rules to classify them as variable interest entities, VIE, and consolidate the entities on the balance sheet rather than report them using the equity method as in the past. Under current U.S. GAAP pension accounting standards, the amount of the pension asset or liability that Samolsky should report on its 2009 fiscal year end balance sheet is closes slash to A. A. $4 million liability. B. $10 million liability. C. $14 million liability. The correct answer is A. Under current U.S. GAAP pension accounting rules, which apply 10 firms with fiscal year ends after December 2006, Samolsky will report the funded status of the plan on its balance sheet. 
Funded status equals fair market value of plan assets less PBO equals $316 million less $320 million. Equals $4 million underfunded. Therefore, Samolsky will report a $4 million liability on its balance sheet. Question 5. Andrew Carson is an equity analyst employed at Lee, Vincent, and Associates, an investment research firm. In a conversation with his supervisor, Daniel Lau, Carson makes the following two statements about defined contribution plans. Statement I, employers often face onerous disclosure requirements. Statement 2, employers often bear all the investment risk. Carson is responsible for following Samolsky Enterprises, Samolsky, a publicly traded firm that produces motorcycles and other mechanical parts. It operates exclusively in the United States. At the end of its 2009 fiscal year, Samolsky's employee pension plan had a projected benefit obligation, PBO, of $320 million. Also, unrecognized prior service costs were $35 million, the fair value of plan assets was $316 million, and the unrecognized actuarial gain was $21 million. Carson believes the rate of compensation increase will be 5% as opposed to 4% in the previous year, and the discount rate will be 7% as opposed to 8% in the previous year. Question 5. This past year, Samolsky began using special purpose entities, SPEs, for various reasons. In preparation for analyzing the SPE disclosures and the footnotes to the financial statements, Carson prepares a memo on SPEs. In the memo, he correctly concludes that the company will be required under new accounting rules to classify them as variable interest entities, VIE, and consolidate the entities on the balance sheet rather than report them using the equity method as in the past. Based on Carson's projections of the discount rate, what are the likely effects on the projected benefit obligation, PBO, and the pension cost? A. Both will increase. B. Both will decrease. C. One will increase and the other will decrease. The correct answer is A. A lower discount rate increases the PBO. It also increases the overall pension expense by increasing the service cost and, most likely, the interest cost. For mature plans, a higher discount rate might increase interest costs. In rare cases, interest cost will increase by enough to offset the decrease in the current service cost, and pension expense will increase. Question 6. Andrew Carson is an equity analyst employed at Lee, Vincent, and Associates, an investment research firm. In a conversation with his supervisor, Daniel Lau, Carson makes the following two statements about defined contribution plans. Statement I, employers often face onerous disclosure requirements. Statement 2, employers often bear all the investment risk. Carson is responsible for following Samolsky Enterprises, Samolsky, a publicly traded firm that produces motorcycles and other mechanical parts. It operates exclusively in the United States. At the end of its 2009 fiscal year, Samolsky's employee pension plan had a projected benefit obligation, PBO, of $320 million. Also, unrecognized prior service costs were $35 million, the fair value of plan assets was $316 million, and the unrecognized actuarial gain was $21 million. Carson believes the rate of compensation increase will be 5% as opposed to 4% in the previous year, and the discount rate will be 7% as opposed to 8% in the previous year. Question 6. This past year, Samolsky began using special purpose entities, SPEs, for various reasons. In preparation for analyzing the SPE disclosures and the footnotes to the financial statements, Carson prepares a memo on SPEs. In the memo, he correctly concludes that the company will be required under new accounting rules to classify them as variable interest entities, VIE, and consolidate the entities on the balance sheet rather than report them using the equity method as in the past. Under current U.S. GAAP pension accounting standards, the amount of the pension asset or liability that Samolsky should report on its 2009 fiscal year end balance sheet is closes slash to A. A. $4 million liability. B. $10 million liability. C. $14 million liability. The correct answer is A. An higher rate of compensation increase will increase the PBO. It will also increase the overall pension expense by increasing both the service and interest costs. Question 7. Andrew Carson is an equity analyst employed at Lee, Vincent, and Associates, an investment research firm. In a conversation with his supervisor, Daniel Lau, Carson makes the following two statements about defined contribution plans. Statement I, employers often face onerous disclosure requirements. Statement 2, employers often bear all the investment risk. Carson is responsible for following Samolsky Enterprises, Samolsky, 
a publicly traded firm that produces motorcycles and other mechanical parts. It operates exclusively in the United States. At the end of its 2009 fiscal year, Samolsky's employee pension plan had a projected benefit obligation, PBO, of $320 million. Also, unrecognized prior service costs were $35 million, the fair value of plan assets was $316 million, and the unrecognized actuarial gain was $21 million. Carson believes the rate of compensation increase will be 5% as opposed to 4% in the previous year, and the discount rate will be 7% as opposed to 8% in the previous year. Question 7. This past year, Samolsky began using special purpose entities, SPEs, for various reasons. In preparation for analyzing the SPE disclosures and the footnotes to the financial statements, Carson prepares a memo on SPEs. In the memo, he correctly concludes that the company will be required under new accounting rules to classify them as variable interest entities, VIE, and consolidate the entities on the balance sheet rather than report them using the equity method as in the past. What are the likely effects of the required change in accounting for SPEs on Samolskis? Return on assets? Return on equity? A decrease, decrease. B decrease, no effect. C, no effect, decrease. The correct answer is B. As a result of consolidating SPEs that were previously accounted for using the equity method, assets will increase but net income and equity won't change. Therefore, return on assets will decrease, but there will be no effect on return on equity. Question 8. Andrew Carson is an equity analyst employed at Lee, Vincent, and Associates, an investment research firm. In a conversation with his supervisor, Daniel Lau, Carson makes the following two statements about defined contribution plans. Statement I, employers often face onerous disclosure requirements. Statement 2, employers often bear all the investment risk. Carson is responsible for following Samolsky Enterprises, Samolsky, a publicly traded firm that produces motorcycles and other mechanical parts. It operates exclusively in the United States. At the end of its 2009 fiscal year, Samolsky's employee pension plan had a projected benefit obligation, PBO, of $320 million. Also, unrecognized prior service costs were $35 million, the fair value of plan assets was $316 million, and the unrecognized actuarial gain was $21 million. Carson believes the rate of compensation increase will be 5% as opposed to 4% in the previous year, and the discount rate will be 7% as opposed to 8% in the previous year. Question 8. This past year, Samolsky began using special purpose entities, SPEs, for various reasons. In preparation for analyzing the SPE disclosures and the footnotes to the financial statements, Carson prepares a memo on SPEs. In the memo, he correctly concludes that the company will be required under new accounting rules to classify them as variable interest entities, VIE, and consolidate the entities on the balance sheet rather than report them using the equity method as in the past. Which of the following items, when recognized, will likely increase? PBO? Pension expense? A. Actuarial loss, expected return on plan assets. B. Actuarial loss, amortization of prior service costs. C. Actuarial gain, amortization of prior service costs. The correct answer is B. An actuarial loss results from a change in actuarial assumptions. In the case of a loss, the amount of pension benefits payable in the future would increase, thus increasing the PBO. Actuarial gains have the opposite effect. The amortization of prior service costs results in pension expense being increased gradually over a number of years, rather than all at once in the year of occurrence. In contrast, the expected return on plan assets is an income component in calculating pension cost, service cost and interest cost being the expense components, so recognition of expected return on plan assets would decrease pension expense. Question 9. Galina Petrovich, CFA is an analyst in the New York office of TRS Investment Management Incorporated. Petrovich is an expert in the industrial electrical equipment sector and is analyzing Fisher Global. Fisher is a global market leader in designing, manufacturing, marketing, and servicing electrical systems and components, including fluid power systems and automotive engineer management systems. Fisher has generated double-digit growth over the past 10 years, primarily as the result of acquisitions, and has reported positive net income in each year. Fisher reports its financial results using International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. Petrovich is particularly interested in a transaction that occurred seven years ago, before the change in accounting standards, in which Fisher used the pooling method to account for a large acquisition of Dartmouth Industries, an industry competitor. She would like to determine the effect of using the purchase method instead of the pooling method on the financial statements of Fisher. 
Fisher exchanged common stock for all of the outstanding shares of Dartmouth. Fisher also has a 50% ownership interest in a joint venture with its major distributor, a U.S. company called Hydro Distribution. She determines that Fisher has reported its ownership interest under the proportion consolidation method, and that the joint venture has been profitable since it was established three years ago. She decides to adjust the financial statements to show how the financial statements would be affected if Fisher had reported its ownership under the equity method. Fisher is also considering acquiring 80% to 100% of Brown & Sons Company. Petrovich must consider the effect of such an acquisition on Fisher's financial statements. Petrovich determines from the financial statement footnotes that Fisher reported an unrealized gain in its most recent income statement related to debt securities that are designated at fair value. Competitor firms following U.S. GAAP classify similar debt securities as available for sale. Question 9. Finally, Petrovich finds a reference in Fisher's footnotes regarding a special purpose entity, SPE. Fisher has reported its investment in the SPE using the equity method, but Petrovich believes that the consolidation method more accurately reflects Fisher's true financial position, so she makes the appropriate adjustments to the financial statements. Regarding the prior purchase that was accounted for under the pooling of interests method, had Fisher Global reported this purchase under the acquisition method? A. The assets and liabilities of the purchased firm would not be included on Fisher's balance sheet. B. Balance sheet assets and liabilities of the purchased firm would have been reported at fair value. C. Reported goodwill could be less depending on the fair value of the identifiable assets and liabilities compared to their book values. The correct answer is B. The assets and liabilities of the purchased firm are included on the balance sheet of the acquiring firm under either method. Under the pooling method, there is no adjustment of balance sheet asset and liability values to their fair values. Under the acquisition method, assets and liabilities acquired are reported at fair value at the time of the purchase. There is no goodwill reported under the pooling method. The purchase price is not reflected on the balance sheet of the acquiring firm. Question 10. Galina Petrovich, CFA, is an analyst in the New York office of TRS Investment Management Incorporated. Petrovich is an expert in the industrial electrical equipment sector and is analyzing Fisher Global. Fisher is a global market leader in designing, manufacturing, marketing, and servicing electrical systems and components, including fluid power systems and automotive engineer management systems. Fisher has generated double-digit growth over the past 10 years, primarily as the result of acquisitions, and has reported positive net income in each year. Fisher reports its financial results using International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. Petrovich is particularly interested in a transaction that occurred seven years ago, before the change in accounting standards, in which Fisher used the pooling method to account for a large acquisition of Dartmouth Industries, an industry competitor. She would like to determine the effect of using the purchase method instead of the pooling method on the financial statements of Fisher. Fisher exchanged common stock for all of the outstanding shares of Dartmouth. Question 10. Fisher also has a 50% ownership interest in a joint venture with its major distributor, a U.S. company called Hydro Distribution. She determines that Fisher has reported its ownership interest under the proportion consolidation method, and that the joint venture has been profitable since it was established three years ago. She decides to adjust the financial statements to show how the financial statements would be affected if Fisher had reported its ownership under the equity method. Fisher is also considering acquiring 80% to 100% of Brown & Sons Company. Petrovich must consider the effect of such an acquisition on Fisher's financial statements. Petrovich determines from the financial statement footnotes that Fisher reported an unrealized gain in its most recent income statement related to debt securities that are designated at fair value. Competitor firms following U.S. GAAP classify similar debt securities as available for sale. Finally, Petrovich finds a reference in Fisher's footnotes regarding a special purpose entity, SPE. Fisher has reported its investment in the SPE using the equity method, but Petrovich believes that the consolidation method more accurately reflects Fisher's true financial position, so she makes the appropriate adjustments to the financial statements. Had Fisher Global reported its investment in the joint venture under the equity method rather than under the proportionate consolidation method, it is most likely that A. Reported revenue would have been the same. B. Reported expenses would have been higher. C. Fisher's net income would not have been affected. The correct answer is C. Under the proportionate consolidation method, the proportionate share of the purchase firm's revenue and expenses would be reported on Fisher's income statement, increasing both expenses and revenues. Under the equity method, Fisher's revenue and expenses are reported without adjustment, and the proportion of income from the purchased firm is reported separately, so that net income is the same under either method. Question 11. Galina Petrovich, CFA, 
is an analyst in the New York office of TRS Investment Management Incorporated. Petrovich is an expert in the industrial electrical equipment sector and is analyzing Fisher Global. Fisher is a global market leader in designing, manufacturing, marketing, and servicing electrical systems and components, including fluid power systems and automotive engineer management systems. Fisher has generated double-digit growth over the past 10 years, primarily as the result of acquisitions, and has reported positive net income in each year. Fisher reports its financial results using International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. Petrovich is particularly interested in a transaction that occurred seven years ago, before the change in accounting standards, in which Fisher used the pooling method to account for a large acquisition of Dartmouth Industries, an industry competitor. She would like to determine the effect of using the purchase method instead of the pooling method on the financial statements of Fisher. Fisher exchanged common stock for all of the outstanding shares of Dartmouth. Fisher also has a 50% ownership interest in a joint venture with its major distributor, a U.S. company called Hydro Distribution. She determines that Fisher has reported its ownership interest under the proportion consolidation method, and that the joint venture has been profitable since it was established three years ago. She decides to adjust the financial statements to show how the financial statements would be affected if Fisher had reported its ownership under the equity method. Fisher is also considering acquiring 80% to 100% of Brown & Sons Company. Petrovich must consider the effect of such an acquisition on Fisher's financial statements. Question 11. Petrovich determines from the financial statement footnotes that Fisher reported an unrealized gain in its most recent income statement related to debt securities that are designated at fair value. Competitor firms following U.S. GAAP classify similar debt securities as available for sale. Finally, Petrovich finds a reference in Fisher's footnotes regarding a special purpose entity, SPE. Fisher has reported its investment in the SPE using the equity method, but Petrovich believes that the consolidation method more accurately reflects Fisher's true financial position, so she makes the appropriate adjustments to the financial statements. Regarding the goodwill on the acquisition of Brown & Sons being considered by Fisher Global, which of the following statements is correct? A. It is equal to the excess of the purchase price over the fair value of the identifiable assets and liabilities and must be amortized over no longer than 30 years. B. It will be reported as an asset, not amortized, and must be reviewed for impairment at least annually, with same test for impairment under IFRS and US GAAP. C. For goodwill that is found to be impaired, the amount of the impairment charge reported is the same under both IFRS and US GAAP. The correct answer is C. Goodwill is no longer amortized under IFRS or US GAAP. The test for impairment is different under IFRS than under US GAAP. For assets that are judged to be impaired, the calculation of the amount of the impairment charge is the same under both IFRS and US GAAP. Question 12. Galina Petrovich, CFA, is an analyst in the New York office of TRS Investment Management Incorporated. Petrovich is an expert in the industrial electrical equipment sector and is analyzing Fisher Global. Fisher is a global market leader in designing, manufacturing, marketing, and servicing electrical systems and components, including fluid power systems and automotive engineer management systems. Fisher has generated double-digit growth over the past 10 years, primarily as the result of acquisitions, and has reported positive net income in each year. Fisher reports its financial results using International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. Petrovich is particularly interested in a transaction that occurred seven years ago, before the change in accounting standards, in which Fisher used the pooling method to account for a large acquisition of Dartmouth Industries, an industry competitor. She would like to determine the effect of using the purchase method instead of the pooling method on the financial statements of Fisher. Fisher exchanged common stock for all of the outstanding shares of Dartmouth. Fisher also has a 50% ownership interest in a joint venture with its major distributor, a U.S. company called Hydro Distribution. She determines that Fisher has reported its ownership interest under the proportion consolidation method, and that the joint venture has been profitable since it was established three years ago. She decides to adjust the financial statements to show how the financial statements would be affected if Fisher had reported its ownership under the equity method. Fisher is also considering acquiring 80% to 100% of Brown & Sons Company. Petrovich must consider the effect of such an acquisition on Fisher's financial statements. Question 12. Petrovich determines from the financial statement footnotes that Fisher reported an unrealized gain in its most recent income statement related to debt securities that are designated at fair value. Competitor firms following U.S. GAAP classify similar debt securities as available for sale. Finally, Petrovich finds a reference in Fisher's footnotes regarding a special purpose entity, SPE. Fisher has reported its investment in the SPE using the equity method, 
but Petrovich believes that the consolidation method more accurately reflects Fisher's true financial position, so she makes the appropriate adjustments to the financial statements. If Fisher Global decides to purchase only 80% of Brown & Sons, under one FRS they will have the option to a. Report the acquisition as either a business combination or as an acquisition. b. Value the identifiable assets and liabilities of Brown & Sons at their current book values or at fair market value. c. Report more or less goodwill depending on the accounting method they choose. The correct answer is c. All business combinations, for example, merger, purchase, or consolidation, are reported under the acquisition method. Identifiable assets and liabilities must be reported at fair value at the time of the acquisition. Under IFRS, Fisher has the option of calculating the goodwill for the acquisition under either the full goodwill or partial goodwill methods. Goodwill is less under the partial goodwill method. Question 13. Galina Petrovich, CFA, is an analyst in the New York office of TRS Investment Management Incorporated. Petrovich is an expert in the industrial electrical equipment sector and is analyzing Fisher Global. Fisher is a global market leader in designing, manufacturing, marketing, and servicing electrical systems and components, including fluid power systems and automotive engineer management systems. Fisher has generated double-digit growth over the past 10 years, primarily as the result of acquisitions, and has reported positive net income in each year. Fisher reports its financial results using International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. Petrovich is particularly interested in a transaction that occurred seven years ago, before the change in accounting standards, in which Fisher used the pooling method to account for a large acquisition of Dartmouth Industries, an industry competitor. She would like to determine the effect of using the purchase method instead of the pooling method on the financial statements of Fisher. Fisher exchanged common stock for all of the outstanding shares of Dartmouth. Fisher also has a 50% ownership interest in a joint venture with its major distributor, a U.S. company called Hydro Distribution. She determines that Fisher has reported its ownership interest under the proportion consolidation method, and that the joint venture has been profitable since it was established three years ago. She decides to adjust the financial statements to show how the financial statements would be affected if Fisher had reported its ownership under the equity method. Fisher is also considering acquiring 80% to 100% of Brown & Sons Company. Petrovich must consider the effect of such an acquisition on Fisher's financial statements. Question 13. Petrovich determines from the financial statement footnotes that Fisher reported an unrealized gain in its most recent income statement related to debt securities that are designated at fair value. Competitor firms following U.S. GAAP classify similar debt securities as available for sale. Finally, Petrovich finds a reference in Fisher's footnotes regarding a special purpose entity, SPE. Fisher has reported its investment in the SPE using the equity method, but Petrovich believes that the consolidation method more accurately reflects Fisher's true financial position so she makes the appropriate adjustments to the financial statements. For comparison purposes, Petrovich decides to reclassify Fisher Globa PS debt securities as available for sale. Ignoring any effect on income taxes, which of the following best describes the effects of the necessary adjustments? A net income is lower and asset turnover is higher. B return on assets is lower and debt to equity is lower. C return on equity is lower and debt to total capital is not affected. The correct answer is C. U.S. GAAP requires that unrealized gains and losses on available for sale securities be reported in comprehensive income as part of shareholders' equity. The appropriate adjustment to Fisher's statements is to decrease net income by the amount of the gain. Lower net income will result in lower ROA and ROA, lower numerators. Lower net income results in lower retained earnings. However, the gain increases other comprehensive income, thus, total equity does not change. In summary, assets, Liabilities and total equity are not affected by the adjustment. Thus, asset turnover, debt to equity and debt to total capital are not impacted. Question 14. Galina Petrovich, CFA, is an analyst in the New York office of TRS Investment Management Incorporated. Petrovich is an expert in the industrial electrical equipment sector and is analyzing Fisher Global. Fisher is a global market leader in designing, manufacturing, marketing, and servicing electrical systems and components, including fluid power systems and automotive engineer management systems. Fisher has generated double-digit growth over the past 10 years, primarily as the result of acquisitions, and has reported positive net income in each year. Fisher reports its financial results using International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. Petrovich is particularly interested in a transaction that occurred seven years ago, before the change in accounting standards, in which Fisher used the pooling method to account for a large acquisition of Dartmouth Industries, an industry competitor. 
she would like to determine the effect of using the purchase method instead of the pooling method on the financial statements of Fisher. Fisher exchanged common stock for all of the outstanding shares of Dartmouth. Fisher also has a 50% ownership interest in a joint venture with its major distributor, a U.S. company called Hydro Distribution. She determines that Fisher has reported its ownership interest under the proportion consolidation method, and that the joint venture has been profitable since it was established three years ago. She decides to adjust the financial statements to show how the financial statements would be affected if Fisher had reported its ownership under the equity method. Fisher is also considering acquiring 80% to 100% of Brown & Sons Company. Petrovich must consider the effect of such an acquisition on Fisher's financial statements. Question 14. Petrovich determines from the financial statement footnotes that Fisher reported an unrealized gain in its most recent income statement related to debt securities that are designated at fair value. Competitor firms following U.S. GAAP classify similar debt securities as available for sale. Finally, Petrovich finds a reference in Fisher's footnotes regarding a special purpose entity, SPE. Fisher has reported its investment in the SPE using the equity method, but Petrovich believes that the consolidation method more accurately reflects Fisher's true financial position, so she makes the appropriate adjustments to the financial statements. What are the likely effects on return on assets, ROA, and net profit margin, ignoring any tax effects, of correctly adjusting for Fisher Global's investment in the SPE using the acquisition method? Ronet profit margin. A. No change decrease. B. Decrease no change. C. Decrease decrease. The correct answer is C. The acquisition method results in higher assets and higher sales, but the same net income. Therefore, both ROA, net income divided by assets, and net profit margin, net income divided by sales, will decrease. Question 15. Jenna Stewart is a financial analyst for Deuce Hardware Company, a U.S. company that reports its results in U.S. dollars. Wayward Distributing Incorporated is a foreign subsidiary of Deuce Hardware, which began operations on January 1, 2007. Wayward is located in a foreign country and reports its results in the local currency called the RO. Selected balance sheet information for Wayward is shown in the following table. Stewart has been asked to analyze how the reported financial results of Wayward will be affected by the choice of the all-current or temporal methods of accounting for foreign operations. She has gathered the following exchange rate information on the dollar slash row exchange rate. Cent spot rate on January 1, 2008, 35 cents per row. Cent spot rate on December 31, 2008, 45 cents per row. Cent average spot rate during 2008, 42 cents per row. Question 15. Will the all current method report a translation gain or loss for 2008, and will that gain or loss be reported on Deuce's income statement or the balance sheet? A. Gain on the balance sheet. B. Gain on the income statement. C. Loss on the balance sheet and A. Gain on the income statement. The correct answer is A. Exposure under the all-current method is equity. Beginning equity is positive, $4,000, and the change in equity during the year is positive, $6,000, $4,000 equals $2,000. Because the row appreciated during the year, the all-current method will report a translation gain for 2008. Under the all-current method gains and losses are reported as part of the cumulative translation adjustment in the equity section of the balance sheet. Question 16. Jenna Stewart is a financial analyst for Deuce Hardware Company, a U.S. company that reports its results in U.S. dollars. Wayward Distributing Incorporated is a foreign subsidiary of Deuce Hardware, which began operations on January 1, 2007. Wayward is located in a foreign country and reports its results in the local currency called the RO. Selected balance sheet information for Wayward is shown in the following table. Stewart has been asked to analyze how the reported financial results of Wayward will be affected by the choice of the all-current or temporal methods of accounting for foreign operations. She has gathered the following exchange rate information on the dollar slash row exchange rate. Cent spot rate on January 1, 2008, 35 cents per row. Cent spot rate on December 31, 2008, 45 cents per row. Cent average spot rate during 2008, 42 cents per row. Question 16. Will the temporal method report a translation gain or loss for 2008, and will that gain or loss be reported on Deuce's income statement or the balance sheet? A. Gain on the balance sheet. B. Loss on the income statement. C. Gain on the balance sheet and a loss on the income statement. The correct answer is B. Exposure under the temporal method is cash and accounts receivable minus current liabilities and long-term debt. Beginning exposure is negative, $5,000 minus $11,000 equals minus $6,000, 
and the change in exposure is also negative, minus $6,300, minus $6,000, equals minus $300. Because the row appreciated during the year, the temporal method will report a translation loss for 2008. Gains and losses are reported on the income statement under the temporal method. Question 17. Jenna Stewart is a financial analyst for Deuce Hardware Company, a U.S. company that reports its results in U.S. dollars. Wayward Distributing Incorporated is a foreign subsidiary of Deuce Hardware, which began operations on January 1, 2007. Wayward is located in a foreign country and reports its results in the local currency called the RO. Selected balance sheet information for Wayward is shown in the following table. Stewart has been asked to analyze how the reported financial results of Wayward will be affected by the choice of the all-current or temporal methods of accounting for foreign operations. She has gathered the following exchange rate information on the dollar slash row exchange rate. Cent spot rate on January 1, 2008, 35 cents per row. Cent spot rate on December 31, 2008, 45 cents per row. Cent average spot rate during 2008, 42 cents per row. Question 17. Will total asset turnover, calculated using end-of-period balance sheet figures, likely be larger when calculated from the row financial statements or the financial statements translated into the reporting currency, US dollar, using the all-current method? A. Larger on US dollar statements. B. Larger on row statements. C. No difference. The correct answer is B. If the row is appreciating, mixed ratios like return on assets and total asset turnover, using end of pre balance sheet figures, calculated from the local currency statements will be larger than the same ratios calculated from the reporting currency statements that were translated using the all-current method. For example, under the all-current method net income will be translated at the lower average rate, 42 cents, and assets will be ram layered at the higher ending rate, 45 cents. Therefore the original return on assets, near income divided by total assets, from the row statements will be higher than the ratio after it is translated into the reporting currency. Question 18. Jenna Stewart is a financial analyst for Deuce Hardware Company, a U.S. company that reports its results in U.S. dollars. Wayward Distributing Incorporated is a foreign subsidiary of Deuce Hardware, which began operations on January 1, 2007. Wayward is located in a foreign country and reports its results in the local currency called the RO. Selected balance sheet information for Wayward is shown in the following table. Stewart has been asked to analyze how the reported financial results of Wayward will be affected by the choice of the all-current or temporal methods of accounting for foreign operations. She has gathered the following exchange rate information on the dollar slash row exchange rate. Cent spot rate on January 1, 2008, 35 cents per row. Cent spot rate on December 31, 2008, 45 cents per row. Cent average spot rate during 2008, 42 cents per row. Question 18. Will fixed asset turnover, calculated using end-of-period balance sheet figures, likely be lower when calculated using the all-current method or remeasured using the temporal method? A. Lower under the temporal method. B. Lower under the all-current method. C. The same under either method. The correct answer is B. With the row appreciating, fixed asset turnover will be lower under the all-current method. Question 19. Jenna Stewart is a financial analyst for Deuce Hardware Company a U.S. company that reports its results in U.S. dollars. Wayward Distributing Incorporated is a foreign subsidiary of Deuce Hardware, which began operations on January 1, 2007. Wayward is located in a foreign country and reports its results in the local currency called the RO. Selected balance sheet information for Wayward is shown in the following table. Stewart has been asked to analyze how the reported financial results of Wayward will be affected by the choice of the all-current or temporal methods of accounting for foreign operations. She has gathered the following exchange rate information on the dollar slash row exchange rate. Cent spot rate on January 1, 2008, 35 cents per row. Cent spot rate on December 31, 2008, 45 cents per row. Cent average spot rate during 2008, 42 cents per row. Question 19. Suppose for this question only that Stewart has determined that, 1. The operating, financing, and investing decisions related to Wayward's operations are typically made by Wayward's local management located in the foreign country, and, two, some of Wayward's accounts receivable are denominated in a different foreign currency called the DEL, DI. Which method is the best to use to translate the DEL receivables into RO, according to US GAAP? A. The all-current method. B. The temporal method. C. The method will depend on inflation. The correct answer is B. In this example, the DEL is the local currency, 
the RO is the functional currency, because wayward is an independent subsidiary, and the US dollar is the reporting currency. The appropriate application of US GAAP is to first remeasure the DEL receivables from DEL to RO using the temporal method. Question 20. Jenna Stewart is a financial analyst for Deuce Hardware Company, a US company that reports its results in US dollars. Wayward Distributing Incorporated is a foreign subsidiary of Deuce Hardware, which began operations on January 1, 2007. Wayward is located in a foreign country and reports its results in the local currency called the RO. Selected balance sheet information for Wayward is shown in the following table. Stewart has been asked to analyze how the reported financial results of Wayward will be affected by the choice of the all-current or temporal methods of accounting for foreign operations. She has gathered the following exchange rate information on the dollar slash row exchange rate. Cent spot rate on January 1, 2008, 35 cents per row. Cent spot rate on December 31, 2008, 45 cents per row. Cent average spot rate during 2008, 42 cents per row. Question 20. Suppose for this question only that Stewart decides to use the all-current method to translate Wayward's results into US dollars. Is it likely that the quick ratio and the interest coverage ratio will be the same or different in row before translation and in US dollars after translation? A. Neither the quick ratio nor the interest coverage ratio will change. B. Only the interest coverage ratio will change. C. Only the quick ratio will change. The correct answer is A. The quick ratio, cash and receivables divided by current liabilities, is a pure balance sheet ratio, which means both numerator and denominator will be translated at the current exchange rate and the ratio will be the same before and after translation. The result is the same for the interest coverage ratio, EBIT divided by interest expense, because it is a pure income statement ratio, both the numerator and denominator will be translated at the average rate over the reporting period and the ratio will be the same before and after translation. Question 21. Kevin Rathbun, CFA, is a financial analyst at a major brokerage firm. His supervisor, Elizabeth Mao, CFA, asks him to analyze the financial position of Wayland. Incorporated, Wayland, a manufacturer of components for high-quality optic transmission systems. Mao also inquires about the impact of any unconsolidated investments. On December 31, 2007, Wayland purchased a 35% ownership interest in a strategic new firm called Optimax for $300,000 cash. The pre-acquisition balance sheets of both firms are found in Exhibit 1. On the acquisition date, all of Optimax's assets and liabilities were stated on its balance sheet at their fair values except for its property, plant, and equipment. PP&E, which had a fair value of $1.2 million. The remaining useful life of the PP&E is 10 years with no salvage value. Both firms use the straight-line depreciation method. For the year ended 2008, Optimax reported net income of $250,000 and paid dividends of $100,000. During the first quarter of 2009, Optimax sold goods to Wayland and recognized $15,000 of profit from the sale. At the end of the quarter, half of the goods purchased from Optimax remained in Wayland's inventory. Question 21. Wayland currently uses the equity method to account for its investment in Optimax. However, given the potential significance of the investment in the future. Rathbun believes that a proportionate consolidation of Optimax may give a clearer picture of the financial and operating characteristics of Wayland. Rathbun also notes that Wayland owns shares in Venry Incorporated, Venry. Rathbun gathers the data in Exhibit 2 from Wayland's financial statements. The year-end portfolio value is the market value of all Venry shares held on December 31st. All security transactions occurred on July 1st, and the transaction price is the price that Wayland actually paid for the shares acquired. Venry pays a cash dividend of $1 per share at the end of each year. Wayland expects to sell its investment in Venry in the near term and accounts for it as held for trading. Wayland owns some publicly traded bonds of the Rotor Corporation that it reports as held to maturity securities. The amount of goodwill as a result of Wayland's acquisition of Optimax is closest to a. $0. B. $20,000. C. $50,000. The correct answer is B. The excessive purchase price over the pro rata share of the book value of Optimax is allocated to PP&E. The remainder is goodwill. Purchase price, in thousands, $300 less, pro rata share of Optimax 210, $600 Optimax book value. X 35%, excessive purchase price 90 dash less, Excess allocated to PPE 70, $1,200 fair value, $1,000 book value, X 35%, acquisition goodwill $20.
Question 22. In 2001, Continental Supply Company was formed to provide drilling equipment and supplies to contractors and oil field production companies located throughout the United States. At the end of 2005, Continental Supply created a wholly owned foreign subsidiary, International Oil Field Incorporated, to begin servicing customers located in the North Sea. International Oil Field maintains its financial statements in a currency known as the Local Currency Unit, LCU. Continental. Supply follows U.S. GAAP and its presentation currency is the U.S. dollar. For the years 2005 through 2008, the weighted average and year-end exchange rates, stated in terms of local currency per U.S. dollar, were as follows. International oil field accounts for its inventory using the lower of cost or Narlset valuation method in conjunction with the first in, first out, cost flow assumption. All of the inventory on hand at the beginning of the year was sold during 2008. Inventory remaining at the end of 2008 was acquired evenly throughout the year. At the beginning of 2006, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 975 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.00 to SI. During 2007, equipment with an original cost of LCU 108 million was totally destroyed in a fire. At the end of 2007, International Oil Field received a LCU 92 million insurance settlement for the loss. On June 30, 2008, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 225 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.25 to $1. Question 22. International Oil Field accounts for its inventory using the lower of cost or Narlset valuation method in conjunction with the first in, first out, cost flow assumption. All of the inventory on hand at the beginning of the year was sold during 2008. Inventory remaining at the end of 2008 was acquired evenly throughout the year. At the beginning of 2006, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 975 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.00 to SI. During 2007, equipment with an original cost of LCU 108 million was totally destroyed in a fire. At the end of 2007, International Oil Field received a LCU 92 million insurance settlement for the loss. On June 30, 2008, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 225 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.25 to $1. For the years 2007 and 2008, Continental Supply reported International Oil Field revenues in its consolidated income statement of S375 million and $450 million, respectively. There were no intercompany transactions. Following our International Oil Field's balance sheets at the end of 2007 and 2008, at the end of 2008, International Oil Fields retained earnings account was equal to $525 million and, to date, no dividends have been paid. All of International Oil Fields capital stock was issued at the end of 2005. Assuming International Oil Field is a significantly integrated sales division and virtually all operating, investing, and financing decisions are made by Continental. Supply Foreign currency gains and losses that arise from the consolidation of international oil field should be reported in A. Shareholders' equity B. Operating cash flow C. Net income The correct answer is C. Assuming international oil field is an integrated sales division and continental supply makes virtually ale of the decisions, the functional currency is likely the presentation currency. Thus, the temporal method is used. Under the temporal method, remeasurement gains and losses are reported in the income statement. Question 23. In 2001, Continental Supply Company was formed to provide drilling equipment and supplies to contractors and oil field production companies located throughout the United States. At the end of 2005, Continental Supply created a wholly owned foreign subsidiary, International Oil Field Incorporated, to begin servicing customers located in the North Sea. International Oil Field maintains its financial statements in a currency known as the Local Currency Unit, LCU. Continental. Supply follows U.S. GAAP and its presentation currency is the U.S. dollar. For the years 2005 through 2008, the weighted average and year-end exchange rates, stated in terms of local currency per U.S. dollar, were as follows. Question 23. International oil field accounts for its inventory using the lower of cost or Narlset valuation method in conjunction with the first in, first out, cost flow assumption. All of the inventory on hand at the beginning of the year was sold during 2008. Inventory remaining at the end of 2008 was acquired evenly throughout the year. At the beginning of 2006, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 975 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.00 to SI. During 2007, 
equipment with an original cost of LCU 108 million was totally destroyed in a fire. At the end of 2007, International Oil Field received a LCU 92 million insurance settlement for the loss. On June 30, 2008, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 225 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.25 to $1 for the years 2007 and 2008. Continental Supply reported International Oil Field revenues in its consolidated income statement of S375 million and $450 million, respectively. There were no intercompany transactions. Following our International Oil Field's balance sheets at the end of 2007 and 2008, at the end of 2008, International Oil Fields' retained earnings account was equal to $525 million and, to date, no dividends have been paid. All of International Oil Fields' capital stock was issued at the end of 2005. Assuming that International Oil Fields' equipment is depreciated using the straight-line method over 10 years with no salvage value, calculate the subsidiary's 2008 depreciation expense under the temporal method. A. $78.4 million. B. $95.7 million. C. $104.7 million. The correct answer is B. Temporal method. $975 million, $108 million. 10 years equals LCU $86.7 million, 1.00 equals $86.7 million. T. $225 million, 10 years, X Vi year equals LCU $11.25 million. 1.25 equals $9 million, equals $95.7 million. Question 24. In 2001, Continental Supply Company was formed to provide drilling equipment and supplies to contractors and oil field production companies located throughout the United States. At the end of 2005, Continental Supply created a wholly owned foreign subsidiary, International Oil Field Incorporated, to begin servicing customers located in the North Sea. International Oil Field maintains its financial statements in a currency known as the Local Currency Unit, LCU. Continental. Supply follows U.S. GAAP and its presentation currency is the U.S. dollar. For the years 2005 through 2008, the weighted average and year-end exchange rates, stated in terms of local currency per U.S. dollar, were as follows. Question 24. International Oil Field accounts for its inventory using the lower of cost or Narlset valuation method in conjunction with the first in, first out, cost flow assumption. All of the inventory on hand at the beginning of the year was sold during 2008. Inventory remaining at the end of 2008 was acquired evenly throughout the year. At the beginning of 2006, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 975 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.00 to SI. During 2007, equipment with an original cost of LCU 108 million was totally destroyed in a fire. At the end of 2007, International Oil Field received a LCU 92 million insurance settlement for the loss. On June 30, 2008, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 225 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.25 to $1. For the years 2007 and 2008, Continental Supply reported international oil field revenues in its consolidated income statement of S375 million and $450 million, respectively. There were no intercompany transactions. Following our international oil fields balance sheets at the end of 2007 and 2008. At the end of 2008, international oil fields retained earnings account was equal to $525 million and, to date, no dividends have been paid. All of International Oil Field's capital stock was issued at the end of 2005. Compute the cumulative translation adjustment reported on Continental Supply's consolidated balance sheet at the end of 2008 assuming International Oil Field is a relatively self-contained and independent operation of Continental Supply. A. Minus $227 million. B. Minus $200 million. C. $298 million. The correct answer is A. Under the all-current method, Gains and losses that occur as a result of the translation process do not show up on the income statement but are instead accumulated in a balance sheet account called the Cumulative Translation Adjustment Account, CTA. The translation gain or loss in each year is calculated and added to the account, acting like a running total of translation gains and losses. The CTA is simply an equity account on the balance sheet. To compute the CTA for Continental's balance sheet, force the accounting equation, A equals L plus E. To balance with the CTA 120 million cash and receivables plus 631.3 million inventory plus 820.7 million equipment, 600 million liabilities, 1.50, $350 million capital stock, 
$525 retained earnings equals minus $227 million. The LCU 350 capital stock was issued at the end of 2005 at an exchange rate of LCU 1 equals $1. The $525 retained earnings figure was given in the IXT. Question 25. In 2001, Continental Supply Company was formed to provide drilling equipment and supplies to contractors and oil field production companies located throughout the United States. At the end of 2005, Continental Supply created a wholly owned foreign subsidiary, International Oil Field Incorporated, to begin servicing customers located in the North Sea. International Oil Field maintains its financial statements in a currency known as the Local Currency Unit, LCU. Continental. Supply follows U.S. GAAP and its presentation currency is the U.S. dollar. For the years 2005 through 2008, the weighted average and year-end exchange rates, stated in terms of local currency per U.S. dollar, were as follows. Question 25. International oil field accounts for its inventory using the lower of cost or Narlset valuation method in conjunction with the first in, first out, cost flow assumption. All of the inventory on hand at the beginning of the year was sold during 2008. Inventory remaining at the end of 2008 was acquired evenly throughout the year. At the beginning of 2006, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 975 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.00 to SI. During 2007, equipment with an original cost of LCU 108 million was totally destroyed in a fire. At the end of 2007, International Oil Field received a LCU 92 million insurance settlement for the loss. On June 30, 2008, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 225 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.25 to $1. For the years 2007 and 2008, Continental Supply reported International Oil Field revenues in its consolidated income statement of S375 million and $450 million, respectively. There were no intercompany transactions. Following our International Oil Field's balance sheets at the end of 2007 and 2008, at the end of 2008, International Oil Fields retained earnings account was equal to $525 million and, to date, no dividends have been paid. All of International Oil Fields capital stock was issued at the end of 2005. As compared to the temporal method, which of the following best describes the impact of the all-current method on International Oil Fields gross profit margin percentage for 2008 when stated in US dollars? The gross profit margin would be A. Lower B. Higher C. The same. The correct answer is B. As compared to the temporal method, the all-current method will result in a higher gross profit margin percentage, higher numerator, when the local currency is depreciating as is the case in this scenario. The exchange rate has risen from LCU 1 per $1 to LCU 1.25 per $1. Thus, it costs more LCUs to buy $1 which is the result of a depreciating LCU. Under the temporal method, COGS is remeasured at the historic rate, thus, COGS is not impacted by the depreciating currency. Under the all-current method, COGS is translated at the average rate, thus, COGS is lower because of the depreciating currency. Lower COGS results in a higher gross profit margin percentage. Question 26. In 2001, Continental Supply Company was formed to provide drilling equipment and supplies to contractors and oil field production companies located throughout the United States. At the end of 2005, Continental Supply created a wholly owned foreign subsidiary, International Oil Field Incorporated, to begin servicing customers located in the North Sea. International Oil Field maintains its financial statements in a currency known as the Local Currency Unit, LCU. Continental Supply follows U.S. GAAP and its presentation currency is the U.S. dollar. For the years 2005 through 2008, the weighted average and year-end exchange rates, stated in terms of local currency per U.S. dollar, were as follows. Question 26. International Oil Field accounts for its inventory using the lower of cost or Narlset valuation method in conjunction with the first in, first out, cost flow assumption. All of the inventory on hand at the beginning of the year was sold during 2008. Inventory remaining at the end of 2008 was acquired evenly throughout the year. At the beginning of 2006, International Oil Field purchased equipment totaling LCU 975 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.00 to SI. During 2007, equipment with an original cost of LCU 108 million was totally destroyed in a fire. At the end of 2007, International Oil Field received a LCU 92 million insurance settlement for the loss. 
On June 30, 2008, International Oilfield purchased equipment totaling LCU $225 million when the exchange rate was LCU $1.25 to $1. For the years 2007 and 2008, Continental Supply reported International Oilfield revenues in its Consolidated Income Statement of S$375 million and $450 million, respectively. There were no intercompany transactions. Following our International Oilfield's balance sheets at the end of 2007 and 2008. At the end of 2008, International Oil Fields retained earnings account was equal to $525 million and, to date, no dividends have been paid. All of International Oil Fields capital stock was issued at the end of 2005. When remeasuring International Oil Fields 2008 financial statements into the presentation currency, which of the following ratios is not affected by changing exchange rates under the temporal method? A current ratio. B total asset turnover. C quick ratio. The correct answer is C. Both the numerator, cash plus receivables, and denominator, current liabilities, of the quick ratio are remeasured at the current exchange rate under the temporal method. Inventories are ignored in the quick ratio. Since the same rate is used to remeasure both the numerator and denominator, the ratio does not change when stated in the presentation currency. Question 27. In 2001, Continental Supply Company was formed to provide drilling equipment and supplies to contractors and oilfield production companies located throughout the United States. At the end of 2005, Continental Supply created a wholly owned foreign subsidiary, International Oilfield Incorporated, to begin servicing customers located in the North Sea. International Oilfield maintains its financial statements in a currency known as the Local Currency Unit, LCU. Continental Supply follows U.S. GAAP and its presentation currency is the U.S. dollar. For the years 2005 through 2008, the weighted average and year-end exchange rates, stated in terms of local currency per U.S. dollar, were as follows. Question 27. International Oilfield accounts for its inventory using the lower of cost or Narlset valuation method in conjunction with the first in, first out, cost flow assumption. All of the inventory on hand at the beginning of the year was sold during 2008. Inventory remaining at the end of 2008 was acquired evenly throughout the year. At the beginning of 2006, International Oilfield purchased equipment totaling LCU $975 million when the exchange rate was LCU 1.00 to SI. During 2007, equipment with an original cost of LCU $108 million was totally destroyed in a fire. At the end of 2007, International Oilfield received a LCU $92 million insurance settlement for the loss. On June 30, 2008, International Oilfield purchased equipment totaling LCU $225 million when the exchange rate was LCU $1.25 to $1. For the years 2007 and 2008, Continental Supply reported International Oilfield revenues in its Consolidated Income Statement of S$375 million and $450 million, respectively. There were no intercompany transactions. Following our International Oilfield's balance sheets at the end of 2007 and 2008, at the end of 2008, International Oil Fields retained earnings account was equal to $525 million and, to date, no dividends have been paid. All of International Oil Fields capital stock was issued at the end of 2005. Assume the country where International Oil Field is operating has been experiencing 30% annual inflation over the past three years. Which of the following best describes the effect on Continental's consolidated financial statements for the year ended 2008? A a gain is recognized in the income statement. B. A loss is recognized in the income statement. C. A gain is recognized as a direct adjustment to the balance sheet. The correct answer is A. The temporal method is required if the foreign subsidiary is operating in a highly inflationary environment, defined as cumulative inflation of more than 100% in a three-year period. Compounded inflation of 30% annually for three years is approximately 120%, 1.31. Under the temporal method, Remeasurement gains and losses are recognized in the income statement. In this case, International Oil Field has a net monetary liability position, monetary liabilities of 600 million greater than monetary assets of 120 million. Holding net monetary liabilities denominated in a currency that is depreciating will result in a gain. Question 28. Viper Motor Company, a publicly traded automobile manufacturer located in Detroit, Michigan, periodically invests its excess cash in low risk fixed income securities. At the end of 2009, Viper's investment portfolio consisted of two separate bond investments, Pinto Corporation and Vega Incorporated. 
On January 2, 2009, Viper purchased $10 million of Pinto's 4% annual coupon bonds at 92% of par. The bonds were priced to yield 5%. Viper intends to hold the bonds to maturity. At the end of 2009, the bonds had a fair value of $9.6 million. On July I, 2009, Viper purchased $7 million of Vega's 5% semi-annual coupon mortgage bonds at par. The bonds mature in 20 years. At the end of 2009, the market rate of interest for similar bonds was 4%. Viper intends to sell the securities in the near term in order to profit from expected interest rate declines. Neither of the bond investments was sold by Viper in 2009. On January 1, 2010, Viper purchased a 60% controlling interest in Gremlin Corporation for $900 million. Viper paid for the acquisition with shares of its common stock. Exhibit 1 contains Viper's and Gremlin's pre-acquisition balance sheet data. Question 28. The carrying value of Viper's investment portfolio as of December 31, 2009 is closest to a. $16.6 million. b. $17.2 million. c. $17.5 million. The correct answer is B. Held to maturity securities are reported on the balance sheet at amortized cost. At the end of 2009, the Pinto bonds have a carrying value of $9,260,000. $9,200,000 issue price plus $60,000 discount amortization. The amortized discount is equal to the $60,000 difference between the interest expense of $460,000. $9,200,000 by 5% and the $400,000 coupon payment, $10 million by 4%. Trading securities are reported on the balance sheet at fair value. AC the end of 2009, the fair value of the Vega bonds was $7,941,591, and equals 39,1 equals 2, PMT equals 175,000, FV equals 7 million, Sol for PV. Thus, at the end of 2009, the investment portfolio is reported at $17.2 million, 9,260,000 Pinto bond plus 7,941,591 Vega bond. Question 29. Viper Motor Company, a publicly traded automobile manufacturer located in Detroit, Michigan, periodically invests its excess cash in low-risk fixed income securities. At the end of 2009, Viper's investment portfolio consisted of two separate bond investments, Pinto Corporation and Vega Incorporated. On January 2, 2009, Viper purchased $10 million of Pinto's 4% annual coupon bonds at 92% of par. The bonds were priced to yield 5%. Viper intends to hold the bonds to maturity. At the end of 2009, the bonds had a fair value of $9.6 million. On July I, 2009, Viper purchased $7 million of Vega's 5% semi-annual coupon mortgage bonds at par. The bonds mature in 20 years. At the end of 2009, the market rate of interest for similar bonds was 4%. Viper intends to sell the securities in the near term in order to profit from expected interest rate declines. Neither of the bond investments was sold by Viper in 2009. On January 1, 2010, Viper purchased a 60% controlling interest in Gremlin Corporation for $900 million. Viper paid for the acquisition with shares of its common stock. Exhibit 1 contains Viper's and Gremlin's pre-acquisition balance sheet data. Question 29. If Viper had initially classified its Vega bond investment as available for sale, which of the following best describes the most likely effect for the year ended 2009? A. Lower asset turnover. B. Higher return on equity. C. Lower net profit margin. The correct answer is C. A $941,591 unrealized gain. 7,941,591 FV 7 million BV, was included in Viper's net income since the Vega bonds were classified as trading securities. Had the Vega bonds been classified as available for sale, the unrealized gain would have been reported as a component of stockholders' equity. In that case, net profit margin would have been lower, lower numerator. Question 30. Viper Motor Company, a publicly traded automobile manufacturer located in Detroit, Michigan periodically invests its excess cash in low-risk fixed-income securities. At the end of 2009, Viper's investment portfolio consisted of two separate bond investments, Pinto Corporation and Vega Incorporated. On January 2, 2009, Viper purchased $10 million of Pinto's 4% annual coupon bonds at 92% of par. The bonds were priced to yield 5%. Viper intends to hold the bonds to maturity. At the end of 2009, 
the bonds had a fair value of $9.6 million. On July I, 2009, Viper purchased $7 million of Vega's 5% semi-annual coupon mortgage bonds at par. The bonds mature in 20 years. At the end of 2009, the market rate of interest for similar bonds was 4%. Viper intends to sell the securities in the near term in order to profit from expected interest rate declines. Neither of the bond investments was sold by Viper in 2009. On January 1, 2010, Viper purchased a 60% controlling interest in Gremlin Corporation for $900 million. Viper paid for the acquisition with shares of its common stock. Exhibit 1 contains Viper's and Gremlin's pre-acquisition balance sheet data. Question 30. What is the appropriate adjustment, if any, if the Pinto bonds are reclassified as available for sale securities during 2010? A. The difference between the fair value and the carrying value on the date of reclassification is recognized in Viper's other comprehensive income. B. Any unrealized gain or loss, as of the date of reclassification, is immediately recognized in Viper's net income. C. No adjustment is necessary because reclassification to slash from available for sale is strictly prohibited under U.S. GAAP and IFRS. The correct answer is A. Reclassifying HCLD to maturity security to available fiber sale involves seating the investment on the balance sheet at fair value and recognizing the difference in the fair value and the carrying value as other comprehensive income. Question 31. Viper Motor Company, a publicly traded automobile manufacturer located in Detroit, Michigan, periodically invests its excess cash in low-risk fixed income securities. At the end of 2009, Viper's investment portfolio consisted of two separate bond investments, Pinto Corporation and Vega Incorporated. On January 2, 2009, Viper purchased $10 million of Pinto's 4% annual coupon bonds at 92% of par. The bonds were priced to yield 5%. Viper intends to hold the bonds to maturity. At the end of 2009, the bonds had a fair value of $9.6 million. On July I, 2009, Viper purchased $7 million of Vega's 5% semi-annual coupon mortgage bonds at par. The bonds mature in 20 years. At the end of 2009, the market rate of interest for similar bonds was 4%. Viper intends to sell the securities in the near term in order to profit from expected interest rate declines. Neither of the bond investments was sold by Viper in 2009. On January 1, 2010, Viper purchased a 60% controlling interest in Gremlin Corporation for $900 million. Viper paid for the acquisition with shares of its common stock. Exhibit 1 contains Viper's and Gremlin's pre-acquisition balance sheet data. Question 31. The amount of goodwill Viper should report in its consolidated balance sheet immediately after the acquisition of Gremlin is closest to a. $250 million under the partial goodwill method. b. $350 million under the pooling method. c. $400 million under the full goodwill method. Full goodwill method, in millions, fair value of Gremlin $1,500, 900 purchase price, 60% ownership interest less, fair value of Gremlin's dash identifiable net assets 1.100, 700 CA plus 950 NCA, 250 CL, 300 limited goodwill $400 dash partial goodwill method, in millions purchase price $900 dash less, pro rate a share of Gremlin's identifiable net assets at FV660, 700 CA plus 950 NCA, 250 CL, 300 limited, x 60%. Goodwill $240- Goodwill is not created under the pooling method. Question 32. Viper Motor Company, a publicly traded automobile manufacturer located in Detroit, Michigan, periodically invests its excess cash in low-risk fixed income securities. At the end of 2009, Viper's investment portfolio consisted of two separate bond investments, Pinto Corporation and Vega Incorporated. On January 2, 2009, Viper purchased $10 million of Pinto's 4% annual coupon bonds at 92% of par. The bonds were priced to yield 5%. Viper intends to hold the bonds to maturity. At the end of 2009, the bonds had a fair value of $9.6 million. On July I, 2009, Viper purchased $7 million of Vega's 5% semi-annual coupon mortgage bonds at par. The bonds mature in 20 years. At the end of 2009, the market rate of interest for similar bonds was 4%. Viper intends to sell the securities in the near term in order to profit from expected interest rate declines. Neither of the bond investments was sold by Viper in 2009. On January 1, 2010, Viper purchased a 60% controlling interest in Gremlin Corporation for $900 million. 
Viper paid for the acquisition with shares of its common stock. Exhibit 1 contains Viper's and Gremlin's pre-acquisition balance sheet data. Question 32. According to US GAAP, Viper's long-term debt-to-equity ratio, calculated immediately after the acquisition, is closest to a. 1.07 b. 1.10 c. 1.12 The correct answer is b. Viper's post-acquisition limited is $8,000 million, 7,700 million BV of Viper plus 300 million fair value, FV, of Gremlin debt. Viper's post-acquisition equity is equal to $7,300 million, 5,800 million Viper pre-acquisition equity plus 900 million FV of shares used to acquire Gremlin plus 600 million non-controlling interest. Under US GAAP, the non-controlling interest is based on the full goodwill method, 1,500 million FV of Gremlin X 40% non-controlling interest. Thus, the long-term debt-to-equity ratio is 1.10, 8,000 million limited, 7,300 million equity. Question 33. Viper Motor Company, a publicly traded automobile manufacturer located in Detroit, Michigan, periodically invests its excess cash in low-risk fixed-income securities. At the end of 2009, Viper's investment portfolio consisted of two separate bond investments, Pinto Corporation and Vega Incorporated. On January 2, 2009, Viper purchased $10 million of Pinto's 4% annual coupon bonds at 92% of par. The bonds were priced to yield 5%. Viper intends to hold the bonds to maturity. At the end of 2009, the bonds had a fair value of $9.6 million. On July I, 2009, Viper purchased $7 million of Vega's 5% semi-annual coupon mortgage bonds at par. The bonds mature in 20 years. At the end of 2009, the market rate of interest for similar bonds was 4%. Viper intends to sell the securities in the near term in order to profit from expected interest rate declines. Neither of the bond investments was sold by Viper in 2009. On January 1, 2010, Viper purchased a 60% controlling interest in Gremlin Corporation for $900 million. Viper paid for the acquisition with shares of its common stock. Exhibit 1 contains Viper's and Gremlin's pre-acquisition balance sheet data. Question 33. Using only the information contained in Exhibit 2, which of the following statements is most correct when presenting Viper's consolidated income statement for the year ended 2010? A. An impairment loss of $5 million should be recognized under IFRS. B. An impairment loss of $275 million should be recognized under U.S. GAAP. C. No impairment loss is recognized under U.S. GAAP or IFRS. The correct answer is C. According to U.S. GAAP, the goodwill is not impaired since the $1,475 million fair value of Gremlin exceeds the $1,425 million carrying value. Thus, no impairment loss is recognized. Under IFRS, no impairment loss is recognized since the $1,430 million recoverable amount exceeds the $1,425 million carrying value. Question 34. Voyager Incorporated, a primarily internet-based media company, is buying The Daily, a media company with exposure to newspapers, television, and the internet. Voyager's acquisition of The Daily is the company's second major acquisition in its history. The previous acquisition was at the height of the merger boom in the year 2000. Voyager purchased the Dragon Company at a premium to net asset value, thereby doubling the company's size. Voyager used the pooling method to account for the acquisition of Dragon, however, because of FOSB changes to the business combination standard, Voyager will use the acquisition method to account for the daily acquisition. Question 34. Voyager's acquisition of the daily is the company's second major acquisition in its history. The previous acquisition was at the height of the merger boom in the year 2000. Voyager purchased the Dragon Company at a premium to net asset value, thereby doubling the company's size. Voyager used the pooling method to account for the acquisition of Dragon, however, because of FOSB changes to the business combination standard, Voyager will use the acquisition method to account for the daily acquisition. Voyager has made an all-cash offer of $45 per share to acquire the daily. Wall Street is skeptical about the merger. While Voyager has been growing its revenues by 40% per year, the daily's revenue growth has been less than 2% per year. Michael Renner, the CFO of Voyager, defends the acquisition by stating that the daily has accumulated a large amount of tax losses and that the combined company can benefit by immediately increasing net income after the merger. In addition, Renner states that the new Voyager will eliminate the inefficiencies of the internet operations and thereby boost future earnings. 
Renner believes that the merged companies will have a value of $17.5 billion. In the past, the Daily's management has publicly stated its opposition to merging with any company, a position management still maintains. As a result of this situation, Voyager submitted their merger proposal directly to the Daily's board of directors, while the firm's CEO was on vacation. Upon returning from vacation, the Daily CEO issued a public statement claiming that the proposed merger was unacceptable under any circumstances. Which of the following best characterizes Voyager's proposal to merge with the Daily? A. Bear Hug. B. Proxy Fight. C. White Knight. The correct answer is A. A hostile merger occurs when the management of a merger target is opposed to the proposed merger. In such a situation, the acquiring company may initiate a bear hug in which the merger proposal is delivered directly to the board of directors of the target company. Voyager has initiated a bear hug in the hopes of gaining board support for the proposed merger before management can react to the proposal. If the bear hug is unsuccessful, the acquirer may appeal directly to the target's shareholders through a tender offer in which the acquirer offers to buy shares directly from shareholders or through a proxy fight in which a proxy solicitation is used to convince shareholders to elect a board of directors chosen by the acquirer. The board of directors would then replace the target's management and allow the merger to move forward. A white knight is a takeover defense, not a type of merger. Question 35. Gary Smith, CFA, has been hired low analyze a specialty tool and machinery manufacturer, Whitmore Corporation, WMC. WMC is a leading producer of specialty machinery in the United States. At the end of 2006, WMC purchased York Tool Company, YTC, an Australian firm in a similar line of business. YTC has partially integrated its marketing functions within WMC but still maintains control of its operations and secures its own financing. Following is a summary of the income statement and balance sheet for YTC, in millions of Australian dollars, odd, for the past three years as well as exchange rate data over the same period. Question 35. Smith has discovered that WMC has a small subsidiary in Ukraine. The subsidiary follows EA's accounting rules and uses FIFO inventory accounting. The Ukrainian subsidiary was acquired 10 years ago and has been fully integrated into WMC's operations. WMC obtains funding for the subsidiary whenever the company finds profitable investments within Ukraine or surrounding countries. According to forecasts from economists, the Ukrainian currency is expected to depreciate relative to the US dollar over the next few years. Local currency prices are forecasted to remain stable, however. One of the managers at WMC asked Smith to analyze a third subsidiary located in India. The manager has explained that real interest rates in India over the last three years have been 2.00%, 2.50%, and 3.00%, respectively, while nominal interest rates have been 34.64%, 29.15%, and 25.66%, respectively. Smith requests more time to analyze the Indian subsidiary. If WMC uses the temporal method, YTC's net monetary liabilities leave WMC exposed to loss in the event of a currency, AUD, depreciation. B currency, AUD, appreciation. C either currency depreciation or currency appreciation. The correct answer is B. Under Che temporal method, the non-monetary assets and liabilities are remeasured at historical rates. Thus, only the monetary assets and liabilities are exposed to changing exchange rates. Therefore, under the temporal method, Exposure is defined as the subsidiary's net monetary asset or net monetary liability position. A firm has net monetary assets if its monetary assets exceed its monetary liabilities. If the monetary liabilities exceed the monetary assets, the firm has a net monetary liability exposure. Since very few assets are considered to be monetary, mainly cash and receivables, most firms have net monetary liability exposures. If the parent has a net monetary liability exposure when the foreign currency, AUD, is appreciating, the result is a loss. Conversely, a net monetary liability exposure coupled with a depreciating currency will result in a gain. Question 36. Gary Smith, CFA, has been hired low analyze a specialty tool and machinery manufacturer, Whitmore Corporation, WMC. WMC is a leading producer of specialty machinery in the United States. At the end of 2006, WMC purchased York Tool Company, YTC, an Australian firm in a similar line of business. YTC has partially integrated its marketing functions within WMC but still maintains control of its operations and secures its own financing. Following is a summary of the income statement and balance sheet for YTC, in millions of Australian dollars, odd, 
for the past three years as well as exchange rate data over the same period. Question 36. Smith has discovered that WMC has a small subsidiary in Ukraine. The subsidiary follows EA's accounting rules and uses FIFO inventory accounting. The Ukrainian subsidiary was acquired 10 years ago and has been fully integrated into WMC's operations. WMC obtains funding for the subsidiary whenever the company finds profitable investments within Ukraine or surrounding countries. According to forecasts from economists, the Ukrainian currency is expected to depreciate relative to the US dollar over the next few years. Local currency prices are forecasted to remain stable, however, one of the managers at WMC asked Smith to analyze a third subsidiary located in India. The manager has explained that real interest rates in India over the last three years have been 2.00%, 2.50%, and 3.00%, respectively, while nominal interest rates have been 34.64%, 29.15%, and 25.66%, respectively. Smith requests more time to analyze the Indian subsidiary. Determine whether, he translated total asset turnover for YTC for 2008 would be higher under the all-current or temporal method. A. Temporal method. B. All-current method. C. No difference between temporal and all-current methods. The correct answer is B. Total asset turnover is calculated as, revenue, total assets. Note that no calculations are necessary to answer this question. Revenues are translated using the same average exchange rate in the temporal and all-current methods. The only difference in the total asset turnover ratio must therefore be in the denominator, i.e., total assets. Under the all-current method, assets are translated using the current rate. Under the temporal method, monetary assets are translated using the current rate, and non-monetary assets are translated using the historical rate. Since the historical rate is lower than the current rate, the non-monetary assets, and therefore total assets, will have a higher value under the temporal method. A higher asset value means a lower total asset turnover ratio under the temporal method. The calculation of the total asset turnover ratio using both methods is provided for reference below. Question 37. Gary Smith, CFA, has been hired low analyze a specialty tool and machinery manufacturer, Whitmore Corporation, WMC. WMC is a leading producer of specialty machinery in the United States. At the end of 2006, WMC purchased York Tool Company, YTC, an Australian firm in a similar line of business. YTC has partially integrated its marketing functions within WMC but still maintains control of its operations and secures its own financing. Following is a summary of the income statement and balance sheet for YTC, in millions of Australian dollars, odd, for the past three years as well as exchange rate data over the same period. Question 37. Smith has discovered that WMC has a small subsidiary in Ukraine. The subsidiary follows EA's accounting rules and uses FIFO inventory accounting. The Ukrainian subsidiary was acquired 10 years ago and has been fully integrated into WMC's operations. WMC obtains funding for the subsidiary whenever the company finds profitable investments within Ukraine or surrounding countries. According to forecasts from economists, the Ukrainian currency is expected to depreciate relative to the US dollar over the next few years. Local currency prices are forecasted to remain stable. However, one of the managers at WMC asked Smith to analyze a third subsidiary located in India. The manager has explained that real interest rates in India over the last three years have been 2.00%, 2.50%, and 3.00%, respectively, while nominal interest rates have been 34.64%, 29.15%, and 25.66%, respectively. Smith requests more time to analyze the Indian subsidiary. Determine whether the translation method appropriate for consolidating the Ukrainian subsidiary's financial statements would allow WMC to recognize unrealized and realized gains in non-monetary assets owned by the subsidiary. A. WMC would only be able to recognize realized gains. B. WMC would only be able to recognize unrealized gains. C. WMC would be able to recognize unrealized and realized gains. The correct answer is A. The appropriate translation method for the Ukrainian subsidiary is the temporal method since the functional currency is the US dollar, the parent's currency. Under the temporal method, realized gains or losses on non-monetary assets are recognized in operating profits through depreciation and cost of goods sold. Unrealized gains or losses in non-monetary assets are not recognized under the temporal method. Question 38. Gary Smith, CFA, has been hired low analyze a specialty tool and machinery manufacturer, Whitmore Corporation, WMC. 
WMC is a leading producer of specialty machinery in the United States. At the end of 2006, WMC purchased York Tool Company, YTC, an Australian firm in a similar line of business. YTC has partially integrated its marketing functions within WMC but still maintains control of its operations and secures its own financing. Following is a summary of the income statement and balance sheet for YTC, in millions of Australian dollars, odd, for the past three years as well as exchange rate data over the same period. Question 38. Smith has discovered that WMC has a small subsidiary in Ukraine. The subsidiary follows EA's accounting rules and uses FIFO inventory accounting. The Ukrainian subsidiary was acquired 10 years ago and has been fully integrated into WMC's operations. WMC obtains funding for the subsidiary whenever the company finds profitable investments within Ukraine or surrounding countries. According to forecasts from economists, the Ukrainian currency is expected to depreciate relative to the US dollar over the next few years. Local currency prices are forecasted to remain stable, however. One of the managers at WMC asks Smith to analyze a third subsidiary located in India. The manager has explained that real interest rates in India over the last three years have been 2.00%, 2.50%, and 3.00%, respectively, while nominal interest rates have been 34.64%, 29.15%, and 25.66%, respectively. Smith requests more time to analyze the Indian subsidiary. Which of the following statements regarding the consolidation of WMC's Ukrainian subsidiary for the next year is least likely correct? As compared to the temporal method, the Ukrainian subsidiary is translated. A net income before translation gains or losses would be higher using the all-current method. B debt-to-equity ratio would be higher using the all-current method. C gross profit margin would be lower using the all-current method. The correct answer is C. Under both the all-current and temporal methods, the revenues for the Ukrainian subsidiary would be translated using the average rate. Cost of goods sold, COGS, would be translated using the historical rate for the temporal method and the average rate for the all-current method. Note that because local currency prices are expected to be constant in the Ukraine, there will be no difference between LIFO and FIFO since all beginning, purchased, sold, and ending inventory will have the same cost. When a currency is depreciating, the COGS based on historical cost, temporal method, will be higher than COGS translated at the average rate, all current method, since the average rate will incorporate the historical exchange rate and the most recent, depreciated, exchange rate, decreasing the COGS. For instance, if COGS in the local currency is 10 and the historical and average exchange rates are 1 and 1.5, local currency per reporting currency, then COGS under the temporal method will be 10 and under the all current method will be 6.67. Since translated sales are the same under both methods, gross profit and the gross profit margin will be higher under the all-current method. Question 39. Gary Smith, CFA, has been hired low analyze a specialty tool and machinery manufacturer, Whitmore Corporation, WMC. WMC is a leading producer of specialty machinery in the United States. At the end of 2006, WMC purchased York Tool Company, YTC, an Australian firm in a similar line of business. YTC has partially integrated its marketing functions within WMC but still maintains control of its operations and secures its own financing. Following is a summary of the income statement and balance sheet for YTC, in millions of Australian dollars, odd, for the past three years as well as exchange rate data over the same period. Question 39. Smith has discovered that WMC has a small subsidiary in Ukraine. The subsidiary follows EA's accounting rules and uses FIFO inventory accounting. The Ukrainian subsidiary was acquired 10 years ago and has been fully integrated into WMC's operations. WMC obtains funding for the subsidiary whenever the company finds profitable investments within Ukraine or surrounding countries. According to forecasts from economists, the Ukrainian currency is expected to depreciate relative to the US dollar over the next few years. Local currency prices are forecasted to remain stable, however, one of the managers at WMC asks Smith to analyze a third subsidiary located in India. The manager has explained that real interest rates in India over the last three years have been 2.00%, 2.50%, and 3.00%, respectively, while nominal interest rates have been 34.64%, 29.15%, and 25.66%, respectively. Smith requests more time to analyze the Indian subsidiary. Which of the following statements related to the consolidation of V-MC's Indian subsidiary is least likely correct? A. 
the Indian economic environment meets the criteria to be classified as a hyperinflationary economy. BEA's standards would allow WMC to translate the inflation indexed value of non monetary assets of the Indian subsidiary at the current exchange rate. CWMC can reduce potential translation losses from the Indian subsidiary by issuing debt denominated in US currency and purchasing backslash KGD assets for the subsidiary. The correct answer is C. U.S. accounting standards define a hyperinflationary economy as one in which the three-year cumulative inflation rate exceeds 100%. The Indian economy can be characterized as hyperinflationary. The inflation rate over the past three years can be calculated as follows. Year 1 inflation equals I plus 0.3464. 1 plus 0.020. 1 equals 32% year 2 inflation equals I plus 0.2915. 1 plus 0.0251 to 1 equals 26% year 3 inflation equals 1 plus 0.2566. 1 plus 0.030, 1 equals 22% cumulative 3 year inflation equals 1.321.261.22, 1 equals 103%. U.S. accounting standards allow the use of the temporal method, with the functional currency being the parent's reporting currency, when a foreign subsidiary is operating in a hyperinflationary environment. EA's accounting standards allow the parent to translate an inflation-adjusted value of the non-monetary assets and liabilities of the foreign subsidiary at the current inflation rate, removing most of the effects of high inflation on the value of the non-monetary assets and liabilities in the reporting currency. In a hyperinflationary environment, the parent company can reduce translation losses by reducing its net monetary assets or increasing its net monetary liabilities. In order to do this, the parent should issue debt denominated in the subsidiary's local currency and invest the proceeds in fixed assets for the subsidiary to use in its operations. Question 40. Lauren Jacobs, CFA, is an equity analyst for DF Investments. She is evaluating Iron Parts Incorporated. Iron Parts is a manufacturer of interior systems and components for automobiles. The company is the world's second largest original equipment auto parts supplier, with a market capitalization of $1.8 billion. Based on iron parts' low price to book value ratio of 0.9 and low price to sales ratio of 0.15x, Jacobs believes the stock could be an interesting investment. However, she wants to review the disclosures found in the company's financial footnotes. In particular, Jacobs is concerned about iron parts' defined benefit pension plan. The following information for 2007 and 2008 is provided. Question 40. Iron Parts has adopted SFAS No. 158, Employers Accounting for Defined Benefit Pensions and Other Post-Retirement Plans. Jacobs wants to fully understand the impact of changing pension assumptions on Iron Parts' balance sheet and income statement. In addition, she would like to compute Iron Parts' economic pension expense. As of December 31, 2008, the funded status of Iron Parts' pension plan was a. $175 million underfunded. b. $240 million underfunded. C. $183 million overfunded. The correct answer is B. Funded status equals fair value of plan assets minus PBO, 395 to 635 equals minus 240. Question 41. Lauren Jacobs, CFA, is an equity analyst for DF Investments. She is evaluating Iron Parts Incorporated. Iron Parts is a manufacturer of interior systems and components for automobiles. The company is the world's second largest original equipment auto parts supplier, with a market capitalization of $1.8 billion. Based on Iron Parts's low price to book value ratio of 0.9 and low price to sales ratio of 0.15x, Jacobs believes the stock could be an interesting investment. However, she wants to review the disclosures found in the company's financial footnotes. In particular, Jacobs is concerned about Iron Parts's defined benefit pension plan. The following information for 2007 and 2008 is provided. Question 41. Iron Parts has adopted SFAS No. 158, Employers Accounting for Defined Benefit Pensions and Other Post-Retirement Plans. Jacobs wants to fully understand the impact of changing pension assumptions on Iron Parts' balance sheet and income statement. In addition, she would like to compute Iron Parts' economic pension expense. Which of the following best describes IHA effects of the change in Iron Parts' discount rate for 2008, all else equal? A. Service cost decreased and the pension plan appeared more funded. B. Pension expense decreased and the PBO increased. C. Interest cost increased and retained earnings decreased. The correct answer is A. The discount rate increased from 3 to 5% to 6.0%. An increase in the discount rate will result in lower service cost. 
lower service cost will result in a lower PBO. A lower PBO will result in a higher funded status, more funded. Lower service cost will result in lower pension expense and higher retained earnings. The impact on interest cost cannot be determined without more information. Question 42. Lauren Jacobs, CFA, is an equity analyst for DF Investments. She is evaluating Iron Parts Incorporated. Iron Parts is a manufacturer of interior systems and components for automobiles. The company is the world's second largest original equipment auto parts supplier, with a market capitalization of $1.8 billion. Based on Iron Parts's low price to book value ratio of 0.9 and low price to sales ratio of 0.15x, Jacobs believes the stock could be an interesting investment. However, she wants to review the disclosures found in the company's financial footnotes. In particular, Jacobs is concerned about Iron Parts's defined benefit pension plan. The following information for 2007 and 2008 is provided. Question 42. Iron Parts has adopted SFAS number 158, employers accounting for defined benefit pensions and other post-retirement plans. Jacobs wants to fully understand the impact of changing pension assumptions on Iron Parts's balance sheet and income statement. In addition, she would like to compute Iron Parts's economic pension expense. How much did Iron Parts contribute to its pension plan during 2008? A. $31 million. B. $36 million. C. $53 million. The correct answer is C. $327 beginning balance plan assets plus $37 actual return plus contributions, $22 benefits paid equals $395 ending balance plan assets. Solving for the contributions we get $53. Question 43. Lauren Jacobs, CFA, is an equity analyst for DF Investments. She is evaluating Iron Parts Incorporated. Iron Parts is a manufacturer of interior systems and components for automobiles. The company is the world's second largest original equipment auto parts supplier, with a market capitalization of $1.8 billion. Based on Iron Parts' low price to book value ratio of 0.9 and low price to sales ratio of 0.15x, Jacobs believes the stock could be an interesting investment. However, she wants to review the disclosures found in the company's financial footnotes. In particular, Jacobs is concerned about Iron Parts's defined benefit pension plan. The following information for 2007 and 2008 is provided. Question 43. Iron Parts has adopted SFAS number 158, employers accounting for defined benefit pensions and other post-retirement plans. Jacobs wants to fully understand the impact of changing pension assumptions on Iron Parts's balance sheet and income statement. In addition, she would like to compute Iron Parts's economic pension expense. Which of the following best describes the effects of the change in Iron Parts' expected return on the plan assets, all else equal? A. Pension expense decreased and the PBO increased. B. Retained earnings increased and the pension plan appeared more funded. C. Net income increased. The correct answer is C. The higher expected return reduces pension expense. Lower pension expense results in higher net income. Higher net income results in higher retained earnings. Neither the PBO nor the funded status is affected by the expected return on plan assets. Question 44. Lauren Jacobs, CFA, is an equity analyst for DF Investments. She is evaluating Iron Parts Incorporated. Iron Parts is a manufacturer of interior systems and components for automobiles. The company is the world's second largest original equipment auto parts supplier, with a market capitalization of $1.8 billion. Based on Iron Parts's low price to book value ratio of 0.9 and low price to sales ratio of 0.15x, Jacobs believes the stock could be an interesting investment. However, she wants to review the disclosures found in the company's financial footnotes. In particular, Jacobs is concerned about Iron Parts's defined benefit pension plan. The following information for 2007 and 2008 is provided. Question 44. Iron Parts has adopted SFAS number 158, employers accounting for defined benefit pensions and other post-retirement plans. Jacobs wants to fully understand the impact of changing pension assumptions on Iron Parts' balance sheet and income statement. In addition, she would like to compute Iron Parts' economic pension expense. If, instead of following U.S. GAAP, Iron Parts followed international financial reporting standards, its pension liability reported on the balance sheet would be A. Higher B. Lower C. The same. The correct answer is B. Under IFRS, Iron Parts S pension liability will be lower because the enamortized past service cost of $37 million is eliminated from the funded status. Stated differently, if we subtracted the enamortized past service cost from the PBO, 
the funded status would be higher by $37 million. Question 45. Lauren Jacobs, CFA, is an equity analyst for DF Investments. She is evaluating Iron Parts Incorporated. Iron Parts is a manufacturer of interior systems and components for automobiles. The company is the world's second largest original equipment auto parts supplier, with a market capitalization of $1.8 billion. Based on Iron Parts's low price to book value ratio of 0.9 and low price to sales ratio of 0.15x, Jacobs believes the stock could be an interesting investment. However, she wants to review the disclosures found in the company's financial footnotes. In particular, Jacobs is concerned about Iron Parts's defined benefit pension plan. The following information for 2007 and 2008 is provided. Question 45. Iron Parts has adopted SFIS number 158, Employers Accounting for Defined Benefit Pensions and Other Post-Retirement Plans. Jacobs wants to fully understand the impact of changing pension assumptions on Iron Parts's balance sheet and income statement. In addition, she would like to compute Iron Parts's economic pension expense. For the year ended December 31, 2008, Iron Parts's economic pension expense is closest to a. $57 million. b. $110 million. c. $147 million. The correct answer is b. Economic pension expense can be calculated by summing the changes in the PBO for the period, excluding benefits paid, and then subtracting the actual return on assets. The change in the PBO, excluding benefits, is $147.635 reported 2008 PBO plus 22 benefits paid, 510 reported 2007 PBO. Subtract the actual return to get economic pension expense of $110, 147 change in PBO excluding benefits paid, 37 actual return. Alternatively, economic pension expense is equal to the change in the funded status for the period excluding the firm's contributions. 2008 funded status was minus 240. 395 plan assets minus 635 PBO and the funded status for 2007 was minus 183, 327 plan assets, 510 PBO. Contributions were $53, calculated in question 81. Thus, economic pension expense is $110, minus 57 change in funded status, 53 contributions. Question 46. Matthew Emery, CFA, is responsible for analyzing companies in the retail industry. He is currently reviewing the status of Ferguson Department Stores Incorporated. FDS. FDS has recently gone through extensive restructuring in the wake of a slowdown in the economy that has made retailing particularly challenging. As part of his analysis, Emery has gathered information from a number of sources. Ferguson Department Stores Incorporated. FDS went public in 1969 following a major acquisition, and the Ferguson name quickly became one of the most recognized in retailing. Ferguson had been successful through most of its first 30 years in business and has prided itself on being the one-stop shopping destination for consumers living on the west coast of the United States. Recently, FDS began to experience both top and bottom line difficulties due to increased competition from specialty retailers who could operate more efficiently and offer a wider range of products in a focused retailing sector. When the company's main bank reduced FDS's line of credit, a serious working capital crisis ensued, and the company was forced to issue additional equity in an effort to overcome the problem. FDS has a cost of capital of 10% and a required rate of return on equity of 12%. Dividends are growing at a rate of 8%, but the growth rate is expected to decline linearly over the next six years to a long-term growth rate of 4%. The company recently paid an annual dividend of $1. At the end of 2008, FDS announced that it would be expanding its retail operations, moving to a warehouse concept, and opening new stores around the country. FDS also announced it would close some existing stores, write down assets, and take a large restructuring charge. Upon reviewing the prospects of the firm, Emery issued an earnings per share forecast for 2009 of 90 cents. He set a 12-month share price target of $22.50. Immediately following the expansion announcement, the share price of FDS jumped from $14 to $18. Question 46. In response to questions from a colleague, Emery makes the following statements regarding the merits of earnings yield compared to the P-E ratio. Statement 1. For ranking purposes, earnings yield may be useful whenever earnings are either negative or close to zero. Statement 2. A high EP implies the security is overpriced. The value of one share of FDS using the H model is closest to A. $14.50 B. $16.50 C. 
$19.33. The correct answer is A. According to the H model. Question 47. Matthew Emery, CFA, is responsible for analyzing companies in the retail industry. He is currently reviewing the status of Ferguson Department Stores Incorporated. FDS. FDS has recently gone through extensive restructuring in the wake of a slowdown in the economy that has made retailing particularly challenging. As part of his analysis, Emery has gathered information from a number of sources. Ferguson Department Stores Incorporated. FDS went public in 1969 following a major acquisition, and the Ferguson name quickly became one of the most recognized in retailing. Ferguson had been successful through most of its first 30 years in business and has prided itself on being the one-stop shopping destination for consumers living on the west coast of the United States. Recently, FDS began to experience both top and bottom line difficulties due to increased competition from specialty retailers who could operate more efficiently and offer a wider range of products in a focused retailing sector. When the company's main bank reduced FDS's line of credit, a serious working capital crisis ensued, and the company was forced to issue additional equity in an effort to overcome the problem. FDS has a cost of capital of 10% and a required rate of return on equity of 12%. Dividends are growing at a rate of 8%, but the growth rate is expected to decline linearly over the next six years to a long-term growth rate of 4%. The company recently paid an annual dividend of $1. At the end of 2008, FDS announced that it would be expanding its retail operations, moving to a warehouse concept, and opening new stores around the country. FDS also announced it would close some existing stores, write down assets, and take a large restructuring charge. Upon reviewing the prospects of the firm, Emery issued an earnings per share forecast for 2009 of 90 cents. He set a 12-month share price target of $22.50. Immediately following the expansion announcement, the share price of FDS jumped from $14 to $18. Question 47. In response to questions from a colleague, Emery makes the following statements regarding the merits of earnings yield compared to the P-E ratio. Statement 1. For ranking purposes, earnings yield may be useful whenever earnings are either negative or close to zero. Statement 2. A high EP implies the security is overpriced. Given Emery's dividend forecast for FDS, is the H model the appropriate valuation model to use to value FDS? A. Yes. B. No. The H model is appropriate when the dividend growth rate declines at a linear rate for a short period of time during stage 1 followed by a one-year suspension in dividends before the previous dividend is reinstated, and then dividends grow at a long-term constant rate. C. No, the H model is appropriate when the dividend growth rate grows during the first stage followed by a period of stable growth in dividends in stage 2, followed by a dividend growth rate that declines linearly in perpetuity. The correct answer is A. The key assumption underlying the H model is that the dividend growth rate declines linearly from a high rate in the first stage to a long-term level growth rate. Question 48. Michael Robbins, CFA, is analyzing Universal Home Supplies Incorporated, UHS, which has recently gone through some extensive restructuring. Universal Home Supplies Incorporated. UHS operates nearly 200 department stores and 78 specialty stores in over 30 states. The company offers a wide range of products, including women's, men's, and children's clothing and accessories as well as home furnishings, electronics, and other consumer goods. The company is considering cutting back on or eliminating its electronics business entirely. UHS manufactures many of its own apparel products domestically in a large factory located in Kentucky. This central location permits shipping to distribution points around the country at reasonable costs. The company operates primarily in suburban shopping malls and offers mid to high end merchandise mainly under its own private label. At present, more than 70% of the company's customers live within a 10 minute drive of one of the company's stores. Website activity measured in dollar sales volume has increased by over 18% in the past year. Shares of UHS stock are currently priced at $25. Dividends are expected to grow at a rate of 6% over the next 8 years and then continue to grow at that same rate indefinitely. The company has a cost of capital of 10.2%, a beta of 0.8, and just paid an annual dividend of $1.25. UHS has faced serious cash flow problems in recent years as a consequence of its strategy to pursue an upscale clientele in the face of increased competition from several niche retailers. The firm has been able to issue new debt recently and has also managed to extend its line of credit. The two financing agreements required a pledge of additional assets and a promise to install a super-efficient inventory tracking system in time to meet holiday shopping demand. Question 48. 
Robbins is asked by his supervisor to carefully consider the advantages and drawbacks of using the price-to-sales ratio, PS, and to determine the appropriate valuation metrics to use when returns follow patterns of persistence or reversals. Robbins also estimates a cross-sectional model to predict UHS's PE, predicted PE equals 5, 10x beta, plus, 3 by 4 year average row percent plus, 2 by 5 ECAR growth forecast percent based on the method of average return on equity, ROE, the normalized EPS for UHS is closest to A. 94 cents. B. $1. C. $1.26. The correct answer is B. Question 49. Michael Robbins, CFA, is analyzing Universal Home Supplies Incorporated, UHS, which has recently gone through some extensive restructuring. Universal Home Supplies Incorporated. UHS operates nearly 200 department stores and 78 specialty stores in over 30 states. The company offers a wide range of products, including women's, men's, and children's clothing and accessories as well as home furnishings, electronics, and other consumer goods. The company is considering cutting back on or eliminating its electronics business entirely. UHS manufactures many of its own apparel products domestically in a large factory located in Kentucky. This central location permits shipping to distribution points around the country at reasonable costs. The company operates primarily in suburban shopping malls and offers mid-to-high-end merchandise mainly under its own private label. At present more than 70% of the company's customers live within a 10-minute drive of one of the company's stores. Website activity measured in dollar sales volume has increased by over 18% in the past year. Shares of UHS stock are currently priced at $25. Dividends are expected to grow at a rate of 6% over the next 8 years and then continue to grow at that same rate indefinitely. The company has a cost of capital of 10.2%, a beta of 0.8, and just paid an annual dividend of $1.25. UHS has faced serious cash flow problems in recent years as a consequence of its strategy to pursue an upscale clientele in the face of increased competition from several niche retailers. The firm has been able to issue new debt recently and has also managed to extend its line of credit. The two financing agreements required a pledge of additional assets and a promise to install a super-efficient inventory tracking system in time to meet holiday shopping demand. Question 49. Robbins is asked by his supervisor to carefully consider the advantages and drawbacks of using the price-to-sales ratio, PS, and to determine the appropriate valuation metrics to use when returns follow patterns of persistence or reversals. Robbins also estimates a cross-sectional model to predict UHS's PE, predicted PE equals 5, 10x beta, plus, 3 by 4 year average row percent plus, 2 by 5 ECAR growth forecast percent the predicted PE for UHS using Robbins's model is closest to A. 20.7. B. 23.6. C. 30.5. The correct answer is A. Beta equals 0.8 to 4-year average row equals 3 to 9%. Question 34. 5-year growth forecast equals 6% predicted PE equals 5, 10 times 0.8, plus, 3 by 3.9%, plus, 2 by 6%, equals 20.7. Question 50. Yi Tang updates several economic parameters monthly for use by the analysts and the portfolio managers at her firm. If economic conditions warrant, she will update the parameters even more frequently. As a result of an economic slowdown, she is going through this process now. The firm has been using an equity risk premium of 5.6%, found with historical estimates. Tang is going to use an estimate of the equity risk premium found with a macroeconomic model. By comparing the yields on nominal bonds and real bonds, she estimates the inflation rate to be 2.6%. She expects real domestic growth to be 3.0%. Tang does not expect a change in price-slash-earnings ratios. The yield on the market index is 1.7% and the expected risk-free rate of return is 2.7%. Elizabeth Trotter, one of the firm's portfolio managers, asks Tang about the effects of survivorship bias on estimates of the equity risk premium. Trotter asks. Which method is most susceptible to this bias, historical estimates, Gordon growth model estimates, or survey estimates? Tang wishes to estimate the required rate of return for Northeast Electric, NE, using the Capital Asset Pricing Model, CAPM, and the FAMA French three-factor model. She is using the following information to accomplish this. A middle dot the risk-free rate of return is 2.7%. A middle dot the expected risk premiums arc. Question 50. A middle dot the beta coefficient in the CAPM is estimated to be 0.63. 
ah middle dot the betas, factor sensitivities, for the three FAMA French factors are 1.00 for the market factor, minus 0.76 for the size factor, and minus 0.04 for the book to marked factor. Trotter also asks Tang about adjusted betas. She says, we use a formula for the adjusted beta where the adjusted beta equals, two-thirds, regression beta, plus, one-third, 1.0. How do the adjusted betas compare to the original regression betas? Trotter has one final question for Tang. Trotter says, we need to estimate the equity beta for VIX Pro, which is a private company that is not publicly traded. We have identified a publicly traded company that has similar operating characteristics to VIX Pro and we have estimated the beta for that company using regression analysis. We use the return on the public company as the dependent variable and the return on the market index as the independent variable. What steps do I need to take to find the beta for VIX Pro equity? The companies have different debt slash equity ratios. The debt of both companies is very low risk, and I believe I can ignore taxes. The best response to Trotter's question about survivorship bias is A. Historical estimates. B. Gordon model estimates. C. Survey estimates. The correct answer is A. Historical estimates are subject to survivorship bias. If the data are not adjusted for the effects of non-survivors, the returns based on survivors will be biased upwards.